wills, trusts, powers of attorney, healthcare documents, where do you begin? Today, we're going to talk about estate planning, what it can do for you, and why trusts might be the most powerful estate planning tool you haven't even considered yet. Hello, this is Andrew Busa, and I'm a financial planner here at Advisor Investments. We're here with another Advisor You Can Talk To podcast. Today, I'm joined by two colleagues, Dina Milne. Hi, Andrew. She's an account executive and works directly with clients in a relationship capacity at Advisor Investments. And I'm also joined by Patrick Carlson. Hi, Andrew. He's the vice president of Wealth Services here, and he's actually practiced law as an estate planning attorney. He's prepared tax returns and tax plans for clients. Um, so we'll be looking forward to getting his experience here in this podcast. And, and today, it's, it's all about estate planning and specifically trust planning. And we're going to frame this podcast around real stories so that you, as the listener, you'll hopefully be able to relate to them and, you know, take some learnings in, in when thinking about estate planning that you need to maybe apply to your own life. Andrew, we've received so many questions over the years from clients asking whether they need a trust or not and when they should think about setting one up. And, and really, that's what prompted this podcast. Yeah, and that's great. We love uh, doing podcasts that are prompted from client stories. And Patrick, with your hands-on estate planning experience, I, I think we'll really be able to get some interesting perspective from you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the legal side of it, the financial side of it, those things meshing together is one of the things that really helps to serve clients really well. And you can't make that legal decision without considering the financial and vice versa. And so we're going to try to keep this podcast a big picture. Our objective today is really twofold. Uh, first, we want to give you a basic understanding of what trusts are and how they work, and also what kinds of situations a trust might be beneficial to you. And, and one quick bit of housekeeping here from Patrick, I know you like to throw this out there. Yeah, I mean, so it's, uh, again, we're just going to be really general and kind of high level today. Um, anytime you're making a significant legal decision about whether to do a trust or what type of estate plan is right for you, you definitely need to speak with a qualified attorney. The laws on this vary greatly state to state and based on your own circumstances. So definitely don't take legal advice from a podcast, a chat room, or something you read online. <laughs> really talk to somebody to make sure it's going to work for you. And as part of our financial planning process, we will work with your estate planning attorney to make sure that your financial plan is coordinated with your estate plan. And if you don't have one, an, an attorney, we can certainly help you find one there. Let's dive right in. In estate planning, the word trust, it brings to mind a lot of different things. And one common misconception that I know we hear a lot uh, from clients or from whoever is that trusts, they're only for the super wealthy. And it really turns out not to be the case. So I think first we need to just take a step back. Let's define what trusts are, what they're actually designed to do. Andrew, that's a great point. I've heard that from so many clients over the years. You know, I don't have the giant house on the lake and a giant yacht and an airplane, so I don't need a trust. And really nothing could be further from the truth. I, I like to think of a trust as simply an instruction manual. All you're doing is basically dictating how you want things to happen, both during the rest of your life so a lot of trusts will say, hey, for the rest of my life, here's how I want my money managed and spent, and then what you want to have happen after your death. That's really all that, they're, all that they're doing. Now, the document you get from your lawyer is going to be really thick and have lots of other things in it as well, but at its most fundamental level, that's what's happening. And there's really kind of three players involved here. There's the trust maker. Sometimes you'll hear this called like a grantor or a trustor or a settlor. They all mean the same thing. That's just you. That's the person who makes the trust. There's the trustee. That's the person who's managing the trust. During your life, that's usually you. For most of our clients here at Advisor Investments, we have those clients as trustees, and then they often will pass that along to a, a child later. And then the beneficiaries. These are the people who receive the benefits of the property of the trust. And, you know, that really doesn't sound so bad, and I really like the way that you put it there, is that a, a trust, really, it's like an, an instruction manual. And, and framing it that way kind of makes it sound not as scary. And another concept that we hear from clients is that if they make a will, their estate plan is done. They don't need to do any more work. Um, we've seen that not to be the case as well. So we're going to get into when wills might not uh, accomplish quite as much as trust can. Right. And I just want to add something else. Um, just having a trust in place is not enough. You want to make sure that you follow instructions. And we'll dive into that a little deeper throughout the podcast. Um, but just keep that in mind as well. Good. So, let, you know, we've defined what trusts are to kind of give us this foundation to move on. So let's 
tackle some specific client profiles so that you as the listener might think, you know, this looks like me and, you know, I can relate to this. That's that's sort of our goal is to give you some stories to to listen to and learn from. So the first one that we'll talk about, Dina, we just worked with a couple of interesting cases. Uh, both of these clients, they were young couples, they were accumulating wealth. Uh, talk to this one a little bit. Yeah, so it's it's funny. We actually worked with two young couples at the same time. Uh, they were both in very similar situations. Uh, both of them uh, were in the process of having their second child, so growing families. Uh, they were um, upgrading uh, homes and moving into their second homes. Both parents on both sides are professionals. They work full-time. And both couples went in for an estate planning review. And each one of them came out with a different outcome. So one of the young couples decided to go with setting up a trust. It's a bigger expense, you know, up front, having the the trust document set up and, and having that all put into place. But they had a bit of a longer view and thought it was an appropriate decision for them. They travel a lot, too, so they were worried about the well-being of their children should anything happen to them. The other couple opted to go with a will-based plan, and this would basically, should anything happen to the parents, this would basically set up a testamentary trust. And that's a phrase there, testamentary trust. Patrick, help out the listeners. Sure. So testamentary trust is just a trust that is formed as part of someone's will. Um, Basically, the court will create that trust upon your death through the probate process. Um, As Dina mentioned, They're a little bit cheaper to set up now because wills are less expensive to set up today. But you do have to go through that probate process at the end of your life um, in order to get the trust set up. That's correct. And I think if they move as well, uh, Patrick, you had... um... Yeah. So the trusts that we were talking about earlier and the ones you'll frequently hear talked about are really living trusts. And Mm -hmm. you'll hear these called revocable living trusts or just living trusts. Those are ones you set up during your life. They're a lot easier to move from state to state. A testamentary trust, it can sometimes be trapped or, or... really challenging to move to a new state um, based on, you know, where you died. And we're in a geographically mobile society, so we don't know where we're going to live, let alone our children are going to live years or decades from now. And so, Dina, you sort of teed up these two couples that, you know, one went with a trust-based plan, another one went with the will-based plan. If we fast forward 20 years... You know, so this is a young couple. Now let's pretend that they've continued to accumulate wealth. Their financial situation has become more complex. Patrick, I wonder if you can talk about how things might change, where their estate needs might change at that point. Of course. I mean, these are clients that did a great job for their family by coming in and doing a plan when they had young children. But as Andrew mentioned, you know, time will pass, our children will grow up, and things are going to change in in our lives and their lives. So things that could change. I mean, it may be that a child will have some kind of special need in the future that wasn't apparent earlier in their life. Maybe they have an injury. We also just don't know how a three- or four-year-old is going to approach money. But by the time they're 23 or 24, we probably have a much better idea of kind of their sensibilities with regard to budgeting and managing investments and making decisions. So all of those things can factor into the ways that we might want to change our estate plan as we go. And that's one of the things I would recommend here. I mean, we fast forward to 20 years, but really this family should probably be looking at it every three to four or five years at the most while their children are young. Because one of the other parts you want to look at in that plan is the guardianship nominations, who is going to basically help raise those children if you're not there to do it. Mm -hmm. And that could change almost every year, potentially, uh, depending on the needs of your children. Yeah, I think what I tend to see with uh, my clients is usually they do a review every five years unless something happens. Yeah, five years is a good interval for most for most yes. clients. Yep. There's a few takeaways that we can take from this client profile here. When you're young, your life isn't too complicated yet. Uh, but as you get older, your financial life evolves. You get married, you have kids, you buy a home. Estate planning it becomes a very important part of your financial plan. And it's fine to start with a will-based plan, as uh, Dina mentioned, but as things get complicated, maybe you grow into a situation where you should start to consider a trust for, for what you need for your estate plan. And as we mentioned in this story, reviewing your estate plan is also important every five years or so, or when a life event happens when you have a kid, for example. Great time to, to dust that off and look at it. Um, and, and that's really what would say there. 
So the next profile we want to tackle here, Dina, we see this one a lot. This is someone who they're unmarried, they have a lot of assets, and this brings to mind some different estate planning questions. Yeah. So yes, we see this a lot. This could be somebody who was single, never married, uh, a widow, a divorcee. Um, and it's somebody who has accumulated quite a bit in, uh, in assets. And they usually have specific uh, instructions on how they want their assets dispersed, you know, should anything happen to them. So they might uh, want to give to charity. They uh, might have a small family. They might want to give to, you know, sisters, brothers, nieces, nephews. Um, and so they're, they really want to have a lot of control on how these assets are dispersed. One option, um, and, and I know Patrick will go into this, is to set up a TOD or a transfer on death. And basically, this allows you to just directly designate on an account, a regular brokerage account, where the assets are going. Um, but the trust sort of gives you a little bit more extra control on how that's distributed and how that works. Yeah. Great point, Dina. I mean, those transfer on death, they're frequently used as a substitute sometimes for a little bit more robust planning. And for the right clients, they can work really well. The downsides of them, though, and one of the reasons why I often didn't recommend them as wholeheartedly was because they really don't let us do this what if kind of planning. So, well, what if, I mean, say you want to leave those assets to your niece. Well, what if your niece doesn't need the money or doesn't want the money or, you know, heaven forbid your niece uh, doesn't outlive you and she predeceases you? The trust lets us have a lot more of the planning to take into account mm -hmm. those things than a transfer on death, which basically just pays it outright to that person. So that's one of the reasons I often uh, liked trusts. Now, again, transfer on death is easier to set up. for. So for clients with simpler needs, it's a very cost-effective and easy solution to implement. You really have to just pick what's right for you in your situation. For sure. And it actually reminds me of a story, and I think this this was a very valuable uh, lesson to a lot of people. Um, one of our clients had, I think, eight beneficiaries, eight or nine beneficiaries. They were her kids. Um, she set up the account as a TOD, and then she passed away. And as a TOD, the assets go directly to the beneficiaries, as you just mentioned. Yep. So all of a sudden, there were these um, expenses, like burial expenses. There were some owing um, uh, fees to the place where she was living. There was some medical outstanding fees that had to be paid. Fortunately, she had a small life insurance policy that was set aside for that. And so that was able to cover those expenses. But just be careful. If you are setting up a TOD account, make sure that you do take into account that there will be some expenses, you know, when you're no longer here, you know. So. Well, what if there wasn't life insurance? Let's explore that possibility. Well, with this particular situation, that would have been a huge problem. Um, a few of these siblings were actually not very close, um, and two of them live outside of the U.S. So it would have been a big problem trying to figure out how to pay these fees because, I mean, theoretically you would think maybe everybody kind of claw back a little bit of what they received to help cover these fees. Otherwise, one or two of the beneficiaries are on the hook, you know, to pay these outstanding balances. So key takeaway there, TODs can be appropriate in simple situations, but when life gets more complex, uh, best to think about a trust. And really, just to bring it back to what Patrick said at the beginning, their instruction manuals is really all they boil down to. They don't have to be so scary or complicated as sometimes they're made out to be. But good, let's, let's tackle this next profile. Again, this is a very common one. And I, I think another one that is intimidating for a lot of people because it can be it can seem like there's a lot to tackle here this is a his and hers profile so a second marriage something like this dina talk about this one yeah, so you just said it. These are people that are a couple that's getting married at an older age. Uh, they might have been widowed or divorced. Uh, we're talking about people in their 60s or 70s. Uh, we're seeing a lot more of this. And, of course, each spouse comes into the marriage probably with adult children and with wealth. 
So there is this desire, you know, from each individual that they want to protect the assets for their children, but they also want to look after their new spouse, you know, should anything happen to them. So Patrick, I know I've heard you refer to them as the his, hers, and ours planning. And so tell us a little bit, a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So what you'll frequently see in this situation is, I mean, just because it's a second or, or maybe even third or later marriage <laughs> doesn't mean that there's just purely separate assets assets. So that's where this kind of his, hers, and ours planning comes in. So the husband is able to keep his assets um, separate in a, usually a trust that's that's under his control. The wife keeps her separate assets under a trust in a trust that's under her control. And then the things that they're accumulating together, because if they get married in their 50s, they could still be married conceivably for decades potentially. The things they accumulate together are in a joint trust that they both control. And then upon the death of the first to die spouse, it'll usually that joint trust ends. It's splits up, and then, you know, the the assets can go their respective ways. One of the things here is these are also a really great tool to kind of implement a prenuptial agreement. So if you have a prenup, or um, if this is your situation and you have a prenup, these are a great tool to make sure that the terms of that prenup are actually fulfilled in a way that works for everybody in the family. Yeah, I think you said so many good things there. I think when I first started studying financial planning and really eventually got into having the study of estate planning, I really, this is where I saw the power of, of what estate planning can really do in, in certain situations, you know, for these second, third marriages. Um, this is where a, a well-written, well-drafted estate plan can really shine and I think can help simplify uh, someone's financial life. Uh, so I think th- there's, there's a lot there. So as a listener, if, if you think this one looks like you, definitely reach out to us. Um, I, I know that this one can seem complicated, but uh, definitely give your portfolio team a call. We can, we can help you out with that. Uh, so in, in terms of this next profile, again, it's common. All the ones we're, we're trying to tackle today have been pretty frequent. But this is a person, they're a pre-retiree, and they mainly have tax-deferred assets. Yeah, I mean, this is, like you said, a very common one, but it is a tough one for a couple of reasons. One of them is because we tend to always, um, you know, reach our maximum contributions for our 401ks. We're inclined to put money into IRAs if we're able to. There's a tax benefit for doing that. So we are kind of geared towards putting that focus on building our wealth that way. And we sometimes forget to also build up our taxable savings. And so what we see a lot is, um, you know, people that are nearing retirement and they've got 90% of their assets in retirement accounts and very little in non-retirement accounts. You know, Dina, right there, one of the things that I think is really interesting that happens is is that if we talk to somebody five or 10 years before they get into retirement, we have that opportunity to chat with them about whether making some Roth contributions or Roth conversions, maybe beginning to save some money in a taxable account could really help lessen the impact of having so much of their assets in that tax deferred account. Absolutely. You know, the the thing, again, while we enjoy that tax deferral while we're working, once we're retired and we have to start making uh, withdrawals and taking money out, we're basically paying taxes on ordinary income when this money comes out of the tax deferred accounts. What if there is an emergency and you need to take a distribution to pay for, you know, a large expense? You want to make sure that you have other non-IRA, non-tax deferred money saved up as well. And as part of the financial planning conversations that we have with clients, we do bring this up pretty often to say, hey, we want to build you this tax diversity where you have money in not only your IRA and your 401k, but also money in a taxable account, money in a Roth account if you're eligible to do that. So making sure that you can pull from various sources in your retirement really is a powerful thing that we talk about with clients. The nice thing about retirement accounts is that you are able to direct beneficiaries. So you can choose uh, primary, contingent, you can add a whole bunch of people as beneficiaries. It's it's very straightforward. If um, retirement accounts are going to a spouse, there's the added advantage that they just roll over into their own account. If they're going to somebody who's not a spouse, then they become inherited accounts and there are certain rules that apply there. 
Now, what we see with uh, quite a few of our clients is they do want to have some control over the assets. And so they designate a trust as a beneficiary to an IRA account. And um, I've recently learned that if the trust is not written properly, this can be a very messy situation. Yeah, um, you saw this recently, right? We did. You know, and Dina there, I mean, when it comes down to the control piece, it isn't even just for control that mm-hmm. clients may want to use a trust or some tool to kind of put some guardrails around these assets. Sometimes it's for the protection of the beneficiaries because these things are not, I mean, again, we all hope that we never have to file for bankruptcy. We hope our children never have to file. But these uh, inherited IRS IRAs, inherited retirement assets, are not automatically protected under bankruptcy law. Right. Now, they may be protected under your state, but again, people move around. So right. just because they're living in a state that protects it now, we don't know where they're going to be living in the future. Right. And I think that the key is that you need to make sure that if you are setting up a trust as a beneficiary of a retirement, a qualified retirement account, you want to make sure that it is a properly drafted trust. We recently saw a situation where um, it was not it was just a general trust, and it ended up in a very heavy tax implication to you know one of our clients, one of the beneficiaries. So you want to be very careful with that. Yeah, that's an excellent point because I think sometimes it's confusing to some clients, and since you're listening today, it won't be confusing to you anymore. But <laughs> think about your estate plan as sort of the collection of all of the different documents that really are designed to work together to achieve what you want. Um, so you can kind of think of it as the as this large instruction manual that's kind of dictating everything. Within that, there's sort of different chapters or pieces. So this might be one area where if you have a lot of retirement assets, a lot of tax-deferred assets, um, or even a lot of Roth assets, you may have an extra trust in there. You may hear this called an IRA trust or a retirement trust or something like that. And what that really is designed to do is is make sure that the tax rules that, you know, Dina's client ran into, uh, Mm -hmm. ran afoul of actually, uh, that that the trust won't do those things because it's carefully drafted to make sure it qualifies for all of the IRA. Uh, regulations and the, and the special treatment that these inherited IRAs can have. Well, and a call out here for you, Patrick, is that we review clients' estate plans now. So if you're someone who's listening and, and you're thinking, I'm not sure if my estate plan is set up correctly, reach out to us. You know, we, we can help you. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. As part of the financial planning process, we can take a look at that and model some projections so you can get a feel for how things are going to flow um, uh, you know, once your plan uh, becomes effective. So in terms of this pre-retiree, they had mainly tax-deferred assets. What about someone who, you know, they're pre-retiree, they have a lot of real estate. How, do, how does that change the estate planning conversation? So in my experience, a lot of real estate is typically an area where I found trusts to be a little bit more helpful. Real estate is sort of your classic probate asset, and probate is something we're often trying to avoid just because of the cost, the publicity, the amount of time it takes. So especially people who own real estate in more than one state, it's really important. There's also some special trusts, like a qualified personal residence trust, that can sometimes be helpful for people who have particularly valuable real estate and who are subject to the estate tax. Great. So today we've, we've talked about a few different profiles, and, and I'll briefly list them here. We talked about uh, the young couple who's accumulating wealth. Uh, we talked about someone who uh, is unmarried, but they have a lot of assets. We talked about this his and hers profile, the idea of you know second and third marriages. Uh, we also just mentioned the person with a pre-retiree, uh, mainly tax-deferred assets, or maybe a lot in real estate. Um, Are there any other times before we do wrap up here where we should think about trust planning for a client? You know, the only things that come to mind that are, you know, somewhat common are people who have a lot of life insurance. There's some things that maybe sometimes having a trust as part of that can be helpful. Anybody who has special needs or who has uh, people in their life that are important to them that are suffering with addiction or other issues, a trust can be really helpful to put some protection for that money that you're leaving behind. Um, people who have charitable planning goals. That's another Mm. big one that we sometimes run across as well. And that's not just trust. There's so many different charitable options. You really need to talk to somebody before you make a choice on that. And then anybody who is a non-U.S. citizen who happens to be living in the United States, there are some really unique rules that that deal with non-citizens. So they're another use case where you really have to plan effectively. So we've talked about a lot here. And if I'm a listener and I think I might need to do some trust planning or estate planning, what should I do next? Well, Andrew, I think the first thing you need to do is actually um, 
sit down and get a financial plan. It's going to help you organize uh, your thinking around your finances, get a better understanding of what your goals are. And it's just a good starting point. You know, there's not one solution that's suitable for all. Each situation is unique. And I think it's important for you to understand your unique situation before you go ahead and put a plan in place. Great point. The only other thing I would add to that is for those of you who already have a plan or for those of you who implement a plan in the coming months, don't just stick it in a drawer and forget about it. Take a look at it again every three to five years or any time there's a big change in your life. If you experience a big windfall, uh, an inheritance, um, something like that, you definitely need to have it looked at to make sure that it matches your new situation. Great stuff, Dina and Patrick. So this is Andrew Busa, Dina Milne, and Patrick Carlson from Advisor Investments. Thank you for listening to the Advisor You Can Talk To podcast. If you enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe, review our show, and you can also check us out at www.advisorinvestments.com slash podcasts. Your feedback is always welcome, and if you have any questions or topics you'd like us to explore, please email us at info at advisorinvestments.com. 